Um, on the other side, they are terra trends, what we see. Sustainability is one of them. Um, we only have one planet, so therefore we need to be careful with the resources. Dr. Vomer is a partner and director at Boston Consulting Group. Previously, he served as Chief of Innovation Officer at Celonis, a company that is turning processes into extraordinary frictionless experiences. Dr. Vomer also served SAP for 14 years as a chief for Ariba, Chief Operation Officer, then Chief of Procurement Officer at SAP. As in the end of his career with SAP, he, ser he served SAP as Chief of Digital Officer for the Cloud Group, uh, where, he's, where he helped SAP uh, customers to define and drive digital transformation strategies globally. So without further ado, <laughs> uh, Dr. Vollmer is here with us. I, I hope that everybody can hear that. Just confirm that you is okay for you the image, and I will take myself off right now. Dr. Vomer, is everything with you okay? Perfect, Ricardo. First of all, many thanks for the nice introduction, and hello everyone. It's a great pleasure being here today, and um, highly appreciate the warm welcome as well as having the opportunity sharing some insights. Ricardo and I. We know each other and we are very actively engaged also on social media. It's always amazing seeing the great content um, he's sharing and very happy to discuss a little bit how supply chain, but also procurement is transforming post COVID-19 right now, focusing on customer experience, as well as also on one of the top priorities, which is sustainability. And that's uh, the main purpose of the presentation. First of all, um, guys, I'm very sorry, I would love to be with you in person, but we all know this is not only not possible, we still don't have really a date when it will be possible again. The reason for that is unfortunately still the ongoing crisis, the coronavirus crisis, what we have. Um, United States is doing an amazingly great job in getting the people vaccinated, uh, more than 100 million. Um, I hope it also will move on and accelerate fast in the rest of the world and hopefully we will soon see us. In, if this is not possible on the one side, there might be another option I was really excited about, having holograms in the future, which can also contribute to um, having less, less travel. So what do I want to cover uh, on that? Basically, let's start a little bit with global trends what's currently going on, then the net zero challenge on sustainability and how to really bring CO2 reduction to life and make it make it happen. When we look at the global trends, and I don't want to educate you and um, make it fairly short, but I think overall we, we are aware about the economic situation. Fortunately, even due to the pandemic, the overall economy is not so bad. Um, we see a two-speed world um, when you look at intra-Asia, um, Africa, for example, on the one side, United States, um, Europe and China on the other side. But basically, um, overall, um, I think the economy is uh, fortunately really evolving and continuing growing in 2021, which is definitely a great, great signal. On the other one side, um, there's one trend worth to mention, which is the mega cities, the urbanization, which, which is going on and has also significant impact on how we work, how we live. Now we have remote work as a standard model embedded in more than one year of the pandemic, but also still a continuation in the trend of the mega cities. We will see how this will evolve in the future due to the COVID-19 um, learnings, what we have. Um, being all at the same place or one place very crowded might 
has also one, one risk. Um, on the other side, there are terror trends, what we see. Sustainability is one of them. Um, we only have one planet, so therefore we need to be careful with the resources. Um, on the other side, by seeing the mega cities evolving, we need also to look in infrastructure. I was very impressed about um, Joe Biden coming up with a very large infrastructure plan, uh, more than um, one trillion investment overall, what he plans uh, to do in the next uh, years, in the next decade. It is really amazing seeing such a huge investment uh, going on, but also needed. I lived three years in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and um, amazing um, seeing also um, the life and being part of the life uh, in the United States. I definitely uh, love it as well as my wife does. Um, on the other side, the infrastructure was sometimes really a little bit challenging. And those of you I have been or living in the United States know what I'm, what I'm talking about. One thing, by the way, even three years in the United States did not really work out very well for me is my strong accent. Sorry for that. So you see, I'm a German. You can hear that. And uh, I worked hard on my accent, but I totally failed on that. Um, it's perfect. Basically. Don't worry. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Ricardo. Appreciate that. So, another area is technology. And I'm a tech guy, um, and uh, not a big surprise, more than 14 years at SAP, driving lots of, of digital transformation projects. And by the way, I'm now as partner here at BCG, also supporting lots of our clients by really thinking about what is the right strategy for the future, what are disruptive technologies with real use cases, with business cases worth looking after and realizing it. And one element is definitely the e-commerce, what we, what we see um, now, a shift to e-commerce, the mobile uh, business. Everyone has mobiles um, and even uh, countries or continents which are not so um, evolved like others, like Africa as one example, the entire business basically is already mobile. And that's something also what we will see, what might be another shift in how we really work with the devices before. We probably in the future might not even need them if everything really is connected. But that's probably far, far out now uh, what I'm talking about. But the digitalization will definitely move on with all the impact, uh, starting with um, big data, analytics, um, the insights, descriptive, um, data, what we are using, prescriptive um, data, probably uh, in the future, it will be really a prescription what's going on, supported by machine learning, artificial intelligence, all the new technologies like blockchain, or I like more saying distributed ledger technology might move on as well. The other mega trends we, we see around the world, uh, demographic shift, what's happening right now as well as uncertainty and uncertainty it's definitely something which is uh, concerning all of us because we need to think and supply chains are definitely at an inflection point. What is now the vision, what to do and how to think about the future? Before we do that, I think let's start by looking now into the current challenges. And one main reason for uncertainty definitely is the COVID-19 crisis. You see here the pattern, what's going on from flatten, which was the first thing after the big um, COVID infection rates and the lockdowns, what we have seen all over in the world, it's still not over. Here in Germany, by the way, um, as we speak currently, government is discussing coming up with another extended period, two, three weeks with a very hard lockdown, um, even um, people not being allowed to go out in evening hours. This might, might come very, very soon, we will see. But basically, um, the fight um, is now um, getting the vaccination up to speed and hopefully in the future. And you see a very optimistic trend here going down to, to zero. Hopefully this will happen and hopefully also the mutation will not um, accelerate um, to, to uh, create negative impact here. What does it mean now when we look on the supply chain side um, and for procurement? So first of all, on the left side, let me start by saying that um, I like certain things um, very simple. And for me, supply chain is plan, source, make and deliver. That's what you see here. And the sourcing side is basically procurement, what we are talking about. And currently we see definitely three big challenges out there, what companies are doing. 
um, de-risks your supply chain number one. Because we all have seen what can happen if a city like Wuhan is getting shut down. Um, I think we learned a lot about how many um, of our businesses impacted, of our supplies, no longer um, coming from China to Europe, to the United States, to all parts in the world, Australia as well. Uh, but even in within Asia, we have seen that. So everyone is currently looking on the risk management to make supply chains more resilient. On the other side, it is a reduction also of cost. Very simple. Direct and indirect supplier spend, what you see here, um, is the second priority. And the third one is foster also a different way in collaboration. On the one side, it is thinking about innovations. On the other side, like mentioned, the risk management and mitigation strategy, how do you do that? You cannot do it by yourself. You need to collaborate and think about how to do it with suppliers together. And let me quickly give you an overview of what I'm talking about. Um, when you look here on the left side, this is basically the world, what we know, or basically until beginning of last year, where it was pretty clear, we run really um, business and supply chains in a globalized world. So wherever something gets extracted, mainly in the Southern Hemisphere, Latin America, Africa, Australia could be added as well. And it gets shipped somehow to China, Asia, one of the countries and production runs. And then it gets shipped um, either to the final destination where customers are buying the goods or um, where another process step is needed before finally the product can be, um, can be sold um, to the end, end customer. And what we are seeing now is looking more on the value chain and focusing more on a regional footprint. The reason for that is not only the risk mitigation, which is one driver, it is also thinking about sustainability, but also thinking about the cost. This is something where we see currently that the asset trend looking really, how can we ensure that we are getting supplies? The face mask, where an interesting example, seeing that around the world, what's happening if the product is no longer available. We also learned and for um, us in Europe, it was very interesting seeing that, wow, the machines are mainly produced in Germany. The textile used for the face mask also produced in Germany, but the face mask production, this was done in China. And now you see the shortage which, which came up is that basically the ships could no longer run and, and provide the face mask. Um, globally. And this is also something where you see, wow, everything is connected. How can you mitigate this in the um, in the future and run? Um, we could argue now and basically um, it was very interesting seeing that the Suez Canal was totally blocked and hundreds of ships could not go through. Um, there are definitely events also where we need to be prepared and uncertainty is something um, what we what we need to plan in supply chain management. You might argue we are doing that already and you might have um, um, years of experience in doing so. I learned it by the way the hard way by 2011 when I got appointed as Chief Procurement Officer at SCP. What happened in that year, probably some of you might remember Fukushima. Um, I just got reminded today because it seems now the contaminated uh, water is planned to go back into the sea after a certain filtering process. And um, this was just a reminder for me about, wow, Fukushima was also such an event. No one was really getting, which of the suppliers are getting impacted by that? What's really happening? And this is definitely also showing you, you need to have more transparency and you need to think about how to secure your supply chain and make it more resilient in the, in the future. So, Dr. Volker, looking, uh, go ahead. I really uh, apologize. Uh, can I ask you a question during the time that you're speaking? Anytime, anytime, no worries. I'm Just a, a short question. Do you see that supply chain becomes more efficient during this time of COVID? Because everybody improved their delivery. If you remember in the beginning of COVID, that the companies was uh, kind of, uh, everybody was just struggling to delivery and then suddenly becomes so good that it's super fast now, even in Germany, that often is very, very slow. What's your take on that? And what you saw in terms of data that BCG is collecting? So that's a, that's a great question. And I, 
Definitely would say yes. Um, we see a huge shift in, in supply chains in general, and the data are confirming that, that um, companies are definitely looking and analyzing the data. Where do they really get from which suppliers, which goods, and how is it connected to the production, to the manufacturing process? And um, I can give you an example. When I, uh, one of my first projects here, um, and this is basically an example for um, for lots of companies what they are doing right now, as I learned by looking into the data we are collecting at, at BCG and the surveys we are doing, as well as the projects we have with our clients, that basically <clears throat> companies need now really to look into um, all the different distribution and logistic processes which are part of the supply chain and it's only possible to do this by getting access to the data to the analytical insights understanding um, where are my suppliers where are also the logistic company companies i'm working with what's interesting seeing that for the for the client i'm speaking about um, they had uh, production in eastern europe which is very typical um, but um, in that uh, case, the borders got closed. And the unfortunate situation for this company was also that the logistic um, provider for them doing the transportation was based in another um, country. Wow. And um, this is really showing you um, um, that, wow, everything is connected and suddenly the borders are getting closed. And I can tell you, was Germany was the client, Poland was the uh, production and the company doing the transportation was in Czech Republic. So Europe is fairly small, as you know, Ricardo. It is, sure. it is lots of countries, but basically it's it's tiny compared. And you see it here on the on the world map, what I have on. Uh, look at that, how this relates to the United States or Canada or China. Um, it's, uh, it's really not, um, not so big and uh, many, many countries uh, connected which was not really a big, big uh, problem at all because all the borders were open, Schengen agreement, you could travel wherever you wanted, including also um, all the all the supplies. Uh, there was no customs, no border controls, nothing. But suddenly the borders got closed. And now the, the uh, border was not closed between Poland and, um, and Germany, but it was closed um, um, between Czech and Poland at this point in time ah. to go um, for the logistic company to the manufacturing uh, site in Poland and bring it to, to Germany. And this was really also showing, wow, we never have thought about that before on the procurement supply chain side. And that's a great, great example for your, for your question. Yeah, and, and so this is impacted in the end of the day, the, 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 the end consumer, yes, because... Uh... That's direct impact on that. There are other two questions here for you. If you prefer to answer in the end, there is no problem. Oh, 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 oh. Let's, let, let's take uh, them right away. Gizan, Gizan uh, Pidetsi is asking you, do you think AI will be accelerated when we can see a solid benefit of AI? It is still very abstract concept yet. He, that, he's saying that and he's asking you something else. Where do you see digitalization in supply chain? And that, that's a good point because, it, because maybe Ariba would be the best example, yes, because Ariba is all about digitalization. <laughs> yeah, Ricardo, um, first of all, it's, uh, it's a great question. And if, um, if you talk about artificial intelligence and what we very often see in some sci-fi movies, uh, science fiction movies might be also uh, an example on that, it's really sometimes far out. When you look what how the say 2001 um, was doing, um, things like that. But when you look more on a practical example, and therefore I really like that question, um, there's much more AI currently um, in the way we work and live than some of us might expect. And let's just briefly explain that artificial intelligence is a broader term. Machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence exactly. and deep learning is a subset of that. So all is data science, by the way. Um, so when you look at that, and um, one of my favorite examples for a lot of things, and you know what this is, our smartphones, what we are, what we are using, yes. um, there's a lot of AI already when we use it. Look at Siri, for example, um, and oh yeah, now I uh, use the example of the brand, sorry for that. Um, but you can also go for Cortana from Microsoft. 
um, or um, any other um, any other voice uh, system. This is already artificial intelligence in practice. But it's also, and now I come with a very simple example, when I type something in Google and only two letters, I might already get a list, which is kind of insightful. Um, um, when I started and I did it yesterday to look for a restaurant, um, unfortunately we can't go here in Germany because all are closed, but we can get delivery. I only started RE, uh, two letters, and Google got it already, said, wow, this could be restaurants. And it started with restaurants as a list of suggestions. And this is basically where you see the artificial intelligence is kicking in. And it is basically in all the things what, what we are doing already, um, it is very often already part of the process. Look at your LinkedIn, Ricardo and I, we are active on social media. Um, what are the, the posts, what we see? It is based on an algorithm, understanding this is um, where Marcel is connected, but it's not only showing me my first um, um, uh, connections on LinkedIn, it is also showing some information and I have to say, it is fairly good. I'm, I'm very active user, I have to say. So therefore, probably uh, LinkedIn as well as Twitter have much more data on me or on Ricardo than on, <laughs> on other people, um, which is fair. But this is also showing the algorithm learning. Bring it now down, and Ricardo, you mentioned a software provider for, for solutions. When we when we look now, what does it do really for us in supply chain and procurement? Um, I like the concept of a supply chain control tower. Why? Because you get an overview about your end-to-end -end supply chain, and now you try to connect all the different devices, connected devices, Internet of Things, IoT, um, devices, what you do to really um, get full transparency about your end-to-end -end process, logistics. And when when we advise clients, for example, and we did it for a very large process company, a chemical company, I can be more precise on that. And they were asking us, how can we really connect um, all of that? Basically, um, after the project, they know already when a truck is delayed and what the impact is because they understand these are the chemical products on that truck needed for this production in this production site. And the impact of a delay is exactly that. And they can also assess, is there a mitigation strategy in place? Yes or no. How to do that? Number one, you need the data. You need the analytics. But what you also need to have, and here we come back to your question with AI and the use cases, they have machine learning insights already, what impact is and how it is connected from warehouse, inventory, supply chain um, to the manufacturing process. And this is exactly where you can derive predictions out of the data what you have and also go for the next step. And here we come with the pure play on, on AI. Go for prescriptive guidance, tell the procurement guys you need to increase the stock level of that because it is a risky supply. Um, what we can't afford to run out because it might in, impact our manufacturing uh, process. This is just an example connecting it to supply chain. And by the way, um, the final one on, on that, um, when you look what chatbots are doing today, um, and they are applicable basically for all the processes, it's another great example where you already sometimes don't even know that you talk to a computer when you call a hotline. And I lived in the United States until the end of 2017. When I when I started, um, beginning 2015, um, in the state, um, the first voice calls um, I received from a robot was pretty clear. Come on, hang up. I'm not interested. I don't even want to listen. After a while, over the three years I lived there, 15, 16, 17, basically the improvement was so interesting for me to see, not that I'm a big fan of advertising calls, and please don't give out my number, <laughs> makes this happen. but you really could see, wow, this chatbot is speaking fluently to me, ask me, hey Marcel, um, it is this, and um, I want to talk um, to you about this regarding your Comcast contract, in real case, by the way, I was Comcast customer, um, uh, uh, in 
in this regard. And what's very interesting seeing that, wow, the capabilities are really increasing. And these are the use cases now popping up and they are getting better, better and better. Just to share this as a very concrete example. I hope this helps, uh, but let uh, me know. Otherwise, happy uh, to continue. Uh, who asked the question was a, 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 a frau that her name is Gizin Pidesi. Ah, Gizin, many thanks for your question. Appreciate that. Yeah, I'm just reading the questions. I, the first one was mine, and the rest is coming here, so I, I'm, I'm just telling you them. Make easy. Cool. Please go forward. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Ricardo, any, any time? No, no. And, and really, um, many thanks, Ism and, and Ricardo, for the questions. Um, I think let's make it interactive. Uh, I'm not here just to, to um, present certain slides. I'm here now to engage with you, and I really like. Um, to answer your questions and also getting your feedback. If you tell me, hey, Marcel, um, I don't buy it or I see it differently, fair enough. So I have certain data I can share with you on uh, what we are doing and what we see on the client side. And i um, very happy also getting your feedback, how you see it from your practical experience. Another two examples, and I want to make it very, very brief to um, um, not stress this too long, but a great example, what I really like, and I mentioned foster collaboration. Um, why is it important? So we elaborated a little bit on the risk management side, making supply chains more resilient. Um, you only can do this when you talk to your supplier and you need the data to understand um, which are the critical ones. On the other side, there are two more aspects I want to highlight with that. And you see an example because in the past, I was very often on stage and I used the um, the smartphone, and I mentioned, hey, the Gorilla um, Glass um, is um, is a great example for supplier-driven innovation. Lots of people were saying, oh yeah, we are not Tim Cook when he was chief supply chain officer, now he is the CEO at Apple. Um, uh, we might not come up with that. But look at this example, and that's a real example from a client I was um, I was doing. And, and by the way, I started my role at BCG uh, August last year, so. Um, was right at the very beginning. This client was sitting together with suppliers and was thinking about the packaging material. And they came up with the idea, we can reduce the, the quantity of the packaging material what we need um, to reduce the cost on the one side. That's number one point. Number two is also think about less resources and better footprint on sustainability. And this is exactly why I like this example. Think about how simple it is to address one area. Everyone understands packaging material and think about what you can do and how you can impact that um, to reduce the quantity. And this is driving really here um, and, and showing an example what collaboration means other than just on the procurement side, inviting suppliers, uh, discuss a little bit this and that. Um, coming up then with quality, what went well, what didn't went well, and finally we need to talk the price, and the price needs to go down. Uh, those of you in procurement might know what I'm talking about, the annual meetings, what you have on suppliers. So this is a totally different conversation what I'm talking about now. Here we really see that the collaboration adds, adds value, it reduces cost, but it also helps to think about other aspects like sustainability. That's why I like this example very much. Another element is here, we see a huge qualification. And by the way, lots of um, companies are using uh, machine learning algorithms, looking into alternative sources um, for um, the risk mitigation strategy to ensure that in the case supply chain gets interrupted and look at the Suez Canal. Whoever would have thought about after all what happened, that now the entire Suez Canal gets blocked. And this is, by the way, a 15,000 um, uh, kilometer detour when you uh, can't go to um, the Suez Canal here in Egypt, when you need to go around Africa and basically then go to Europe, wherever um, the final destination um, is. This is also giving a great example on, on what's needed to do. Let me wrap up this by saying that um, the current challenges right now is really to deal with this complexity, also driven by uncertainty what we have on the other side, also moving up from the formerly transactional support, more seen as a service function, 
And then I know a lot of initiatives about functional excellence, um, cross-functional supply chain management, procurement here, um, competitive advantage value driver to become really digital empowered business partner. And this is, by the way, digitally empowered means also using the right technology. Doesn't matter if it's IoT, if you use some machine learning algorithms, um, if you use very basic robotics process automation, for example, it really starts with that to ensure that you can focus on the value adding um, activities. And when you do that, basically, you will see that the current setup, and this example here is from, from procurement, um, that you need to, to transform from the old world, what you see here today, lots of still operational activities, tactical tasks, what you what is seen. Um, lots of um, processes are still basically in your target operating models and process, organization, people, um, to translate it in, in simple words, the enabler, what you have um, to create your value um, and your output are still um, very transactional and functional focused on operational activities. Um, on the other side, you still have a lot of paper um, in the process. I still can't believe it. Um, and now I take a government example. Uh, the COVID-19 um, cases counted here in Germany. And Germany, uh, as fourth largest economy in the world, so not so small, is still doing that on paper and sending telefax. Um, uh, to the Robert Koch Institute, so basically the central institution um, collecting and and measure um, and counting all the COVID cases. Can you think about? But I, I recall. Excuse me to interrupt you, but I recall that you said during your last conversation that Germany is not more advanced uh, advanced country in the world in terms of digital experience and digital transformation. As that's the reason it's like still like that. It Correct is, me if I'm wrong. Ricardo, you're perfectly right. And it is sometimes really shocking when you see and uh, the mobile um, is, I will not show the smartphone again. Um, um, the mobile is still a great example. If you're on a highway, um, even between Frankfurt, where I live right now, and um, Waldorf, SEP, it's 100 kilometers, uh, 62 miles um, in, in, in US miles. And uh, basically, isn't it um, fascinating? Three times you get disrupted um, on, on a highway going really uh, through uh, industrial areas. Um, uh, but it's not only here. It is basically everywhere where you see it. It is still a big challenge. And now think about autonomous vehicles. What you need, the latency, um, the direct connection uh, being online, and also the cars need to build an edge network to basically connect and uh, communicate. This is definitely a leap for what needs to get get done. Germany, I think, is on on um, 26 or 27 from 30 European countries um, in the fiberglass uh, coverage. Um, I think it's three, four percent, something like that. Definitely below five percent. What's happening right now? And this is really showing. Also, there's a lot to do. Therefore, moving from paper to AI-based tools is a big, big step here. Also, coming up with stakeholder-centric process is connected to that. You need to have technology and also focusing on the future. I mentioned the innovations and resilience as well as the risk management side, but also focusing on sustainability. Now also considering, and I added this, new working models, remote working models. I work from home most of the time. Why? The government wants to, for all the people not necessarily needed, at the office to work from home. That's why you see me here sitting now at home um, to to um, to work remotely. Um, and in the future, this might be probably a model. I mentioned the holograms as one alternative. I am still not a big fan that this is really fully substituting um, the personal, the physical con connects. I really like seeing Ricardo shaking hands. I know this is not appropriate anymore but basically saying hello, sitting in front of each other, because it's not only the voice, it is also your body language. You can see me now exactly. until somewhere here, but basically you don't see the rest of my, my body and, and you don't see my uh, my appearance, um, which is um, in an upfront communication mainly, but also um, answering your questions. It is not a big deal, but it is much different if we talk after that on stage or 
just um, when I go down from, from stage or having a coffee, we see us uh, during lunch at a conference. It is a different connect and a much more personal touch. And we are human beings. So yeah, sure. honesty is really important. And therefore, I think all the technology will not replace that in the future. And I think a healthy mix might be something which is definitely needed um, to deliver results. And of course, supply chain procurement it is always capturing the value um, and ensure the price um, and the cost, cost reduction on that. Ricardo, let, let me pause here before we go to the next um, um, section. Any questions so far? And I see we are almost 40 minutes um, in the hour. I, I don't have other questions. Uh, Chris, uh, Christopher, Bjorn, do you have any questions, guys? Everybody is here today. This is the time you are, you are talking for a global expert in supply chain and procurement. He's one of the best in the world. Thank you, Ricardo. <laughs> I appreciate that. Not all sure. your, all, all, you are in all lists in the top, so what I can say. <laughs> okay. so yeah, on social it. media, I'm ranking quite high. That's, that's true, yeah. Yeah, but so. I know you and, and you are among the best, really. I have a question for you. Uh, in the beginning, supply chain, and I don't know if you are aware of a company that calls Intra, in the, we used to call Intra in the US, that was doing a threat forwarding. And they was dealing all the they changed the name. I just don't recall the name right now. But in the in the supply chain, in this area of fat forwarding of containers, especially what we have here in Germany and in in, in Rotterdam and here in Hamburg, the focusing experience was really a, actually was no 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 focusing experience for the people how how you transfer the container, what will happen with the container. Only the communication was important, not the container not to ship, not nothing about customer experience. How do you see this coming? And, and that's, a, I think, is a question related to what uh, Gissen asked you before. How do you see the supply chain uh, hugging, in certain way, customer experience today? Because customer experience is not just about customer and, and coming from SAP, you know better than me, that's about the employees, about everything. And this and the niche of uh, Supply chain is very like old style. If you take a look in Hapa, Hapa Cloyd or Hamburg Sud, they look mm -hmm. like companies of 100 years ago as in the style and the management. What, what is your take on that? That's something that is, can give us a, a clue about what's going on in the, in the daily life of experiences in supply chain. Ricardo, that's a great question, another great one um, on the um, connectivity and also getting full transparency on the data. I think the main priority definitely is, you mentioned some uh, shipping providers um, or the logistic uh, company inter, um, in, the, in the States. Um, whatever the company is, basically, you need to have the data um, to really uh, know. Um, and what does it mean? Let's go for a practical example. When you know when a ship leaves um, in China or in the States or wherever, basically you have already one very important data point because if you see that the ship is already delayed by leaving, um, you know what it means because it takes a certain time, five days, uh, to go, for example, from the East Coast uh, to, to Europe by, by ship. And that's definitely something um, what you need to consider. Having information, knowing, understanding it, and think now about... Um, another example, coming coming back to the question on artificial intelligence, um, where we are using it is when we travel. Um, and I'm not talking about flights, I'm talking about driving by cars, um, um, using, using Waze, for example, Google Maps, Apple Maps, whatever you are using. Mm -hmm. um, basically, real-time traffic information are giving you an update and giving you a chance to react. This is exactly the same what you need by understanding, oh wow, the ship might have left a little bit later. What does it mean? Now, the ship might arrive um, at a haver in at the port in time. Um, you can also get the real-time information about a connected container. When is it really on a track? And when will it leave also the port um, to be on the road? Then you can also see and connect the data. Wow, there's a huge traffic jam. It might be something, a disruption on, on the highway. I lived in Atlanta and a bridge on a highway went down. By the way, this is the north-south um, um, highway, um, which is the, um, 
and the um, uh, the lifeblood um, on traffic going through the city, um, which got which got impacted. When you see information like that and can connect it, so this is exactly where you need the data, where you need to connect, interpret them, and really see also that you can you can work with them. I see. And there's some, let me see who is this, um, services labs. I, I don't know who is the person here, but uh, Clown DRP, POS, point of sales, and e-business, CRM, CRM. I is just making an observation here about... Uh, so we set up plugin, play supply chain, which also can be. What, what's the question? Is not clear for me. Oh, Bjorn is Bjorn is asking, but uh, your question is not clear, Bjorn. So I cannot ask the question. Okay. If you can. Probably Bjorn can, can rephrase that. And um, shall yeah. I move on uh, to show? Uh, I think it's only um, it's not so many slides, um, and and I. Uh, could, could share some insights on sustainability. But I'm very happy also to continue the conversation about data and artificial intelligence. No worries about that. Go for, Yeah, uh, go forward as you think, uh, based on your presentation, in, in the way that you put that before you come here. So that's all right for us. Can yeah. we build supply chain towers and with for e-logistics? Yeah, that's sure. The... So absolutely. That's a great question. I think it was beyond what you mentioned, Ricardo. So yeah. if this is the question, I definitely would answer it. Uh, sorry, I moved on. Um, I would I would definitely answer it with a yes, um, because this is exactly also where you see um, you you need a supply chain control tower to really oversee end to end your supply chain and connect as many steps as possible. And logistics, I, I made an example with the ship and the truck. Um, you need to connect. Um, where are your supplies coming from? Also, when we want to talk, and probably we have some minutes about sustainability, we need to understand where do we get the raw material from? Where do we really ensure that we are um, that that we know when is every step in the supply chain in the logistics process, which is absolutely key. When you when you understand, oh wow, this truck was already delayed, or the ship is now delayed. Um, you can calculate and think already about it. What does it do to your manufacturing process? On the other side, talking about uh, the needed information now on sustainability. Why is it needed? Because customer experience, customers only want to buy if they understand where do the products come from. In the past, it was mainly driven by the price. And of course, price is still important. I don't want to say that this goes away. But well, I see also that more and more customers are now looking into it. Where do I get my products uh, from? What is really in the in the um, in, in, in the um, in the um, wool and in the stuff what I wear uh, as my clothes? Um, where does the cotton come from um, for my jacket here, what I'm wearing, or my my shirt? Uh, but also the other products, the um, um, the food, what what we are eating and and drinking. So basically, yeah, about slavery. I remember you mentioned that about Arriba, that the, the software went until the who is producing is is a kid, is an adult, how they are paid. I remember you mentioned that. Yes, we don't want to have forced labor in in any of our products. I'm uh, pretty sure that, that uh, all of you would agree on that. Um, and, and this is, how, how can you ensure that? You need to understand where do the products come from and you only can do that if you monitor that. And coming back to the supply chain tower concept, which is basically um, um, a central point where all the data getting connected and you get really full visibility about every single step in your supply chain from the planning, the sourcing side, manufacturing and logistics. And from the sourcing side, it also includes lo the logistics that supplies are coming to your manufacturing process. And of course, we want to understand where do, where do we get the products from? Um, what is really also part of the products? And does it make sense also that the products are getting shipped around the world? Um, do I need to get um, the tomatoes, the vegetables uh, from um, a country far out, or is it possible also probably to get it from a location, from a regional provider, uh, much closer to safe logistics and transportation costs? How do you connect all the information? How do you get it? And this is exactly where supply chain control tower helps you. Go. 
I see. And you have some observations here on one question. Uh, so first of all, uh, Christopher Brooks, Brooks, which is ambassador to the CXO. I am good, really enjoying the insights. He is enjoying your talk. And unfortunately, today we are trying, yes, because I didn't know that I have to put sounds for the people to talk with you, but uh, that's a trial. It's the first one. I promise the next one will be much better. <laughs> be professional. Uh, the second question is from Steve Belgraver, which is in Holland, and uh, he is a member of the ECXO. How does the changing and development field of supply chain management impact and influence the customer experience? He is asking you that. How does the changing and development field of supply chain management impact and influence the customer experience? He's asking you, otherwise I would answer, but it's your, your, your show. First of all, great, great, great question. And Ricardo, feel free to also join and, and provide your, your thoughts on that. For me, the customer experience needs to be in the center of everything what you're doing. And basically, on the one side, um, customers driving the demand. Um, if you have the best product in the world or you think it's the best product in the world, customers not buying that, what is it worth? And um, you might be not, not successful. And it's also a question about, by the way, not only the innovation, but also the, um, the right point in time when you launch that. Everyone talks about smartphones, and I did this um, a couple of times here in this call as well. But there was um, a device called Palm, for example. Not sure who had a Palm. Um, I had one, um, which was basically already um, a device, a great innovation. But the customers were not ready. So therefore, um, and I could share multiple other um, examples. Look at the adoption of electric cars. Um, it was a great innovation, great idea, but it started very slow. And Tesla needed to come to really disrupt with an entirely new model and they figured out they can't sell the cars if the charging does not work. And not everyone can can um, have a charging station at home. Some people might live and uh, Tesla was founded in um, at the West Coast, might live in San Francisco where you don't have a garage. Um, so therefore they provided also the infrastructure. And this is exactly also where you see why it is so important that you really think about the end-to-end -end process and supply chain is an end-to-end -end process needs to be and also think about how do you link it to the customer experience. Customer demand is driving what you need to provide and what it makes sense to produce. That's the reason, for example, why smartphones are so successful, why Netflix is so successful in a different industry and I'm switching now the industry by purpose. Um, but you can take also multiple other examples. Look at Google, um, the great success of the search engine. 96% um, of the people here in Germany are, are using using it. Um, and everywhere, is, everywhere. Everywhere, yeah. This is mainly showing you um, and the United States. I think it's also Bing and Yahoo, which still have a certain share on the market, on the search engine market. Um, but nevertheless, it is a customer defining also um, what is important. And therefore, you need to have the data, the real-time information. When I was doing, and Ricardo, we talked about that, um, when we were um, introducing the, um, um, the supply chain uh, uh, connectivity for, um, uh, when I was at SAP for Microsoft, we connected basically the devices, uh, the surface uh, sales data, uh, what customers really buying to the suppliers delivering uh, the surfaces as well as also um, to their suppliers ensuring that they can provide the right um, material and, and products um, included in the surface. This is also um, showing you how important it is to look end to end not only on your product on your sales numbers also looking at the data where do you get it from the manufacturing process and then the suppliers to ensure that the suppliers are also producing enough so that you can continue selling. And if the surface production and we have seen the cycle was not always successful, um, that, that the demand is not there, immediately it can have impact on the production and um, you can adjust the manufacturing. And this is really why you need the data and why it's so important really to have all the data around you. Ricardo, any perspective on the customer experience? I know you are Actually, a big fan of that. It's interesting that you, uh, how, how you answered that because my, my take would be the opposite. 
my take would be that the, the supply chain, uh, the, the question is how does this, the changing and development field of supply chain management impact the influence of the customer, impl- impact and influence customer experience? <laughs> I, my answer would be the opposite. I think customer experience is impacting supply chain in certain ways, even though the supply chain is becoming much more faster due to the requests from customers, obviously depending on the field as, but uh, if you take a real proper, when you, when you buy a fruit or you buy something from Amazon, you need a fast delivery. So this is, is a request from the customer. So you need to deliver it faster. And that's the process that we saw improving in everywhere in the world that the companies first was not, pre- they were not prepared to, to deliver it so fast because nobody expected p- the pandemic. And suddenly they become so well prepared that I, I'm getting things here in, in three hours now in Germany. And that's amazing because in Germany it's not normal. Yes, you take 18 days, you know, 10 days. And uh, the other thing that I would say here, uh, supply chain have many different layers. Uh, if you talk about technology, I think the technology and, and uh, the best person really to talk about that is, is Dr. Bomer. Technology is super advanced in, in supply chain. And uh, I worked also in intra in the past, the uh, delivery things through internet were uh, an e-commerce platform. And that was super advanced. The problem is that you have a very big discrepancy between what happens in the field and what you happen in the technology part. It's, it's two different worlds that have, a, yeah. have to adapt. So you have a, a RIB SAP in our case, or you have BCG working. And then you have a, a Hapagloid or Ambersud or, or whoever is in the world delivering uh, packages and, and containers that they work with, <laughs> with, I'm sorry about saying that, but with a kind of hundred years ago style, you know, that you have to adapt to that as well. And it's very old and conservative companies that you have to deal with them as well. So I think customer experience and customer uh, requests are totally two different things. Uh, impacted strongly the supply chain today that what we are seeing today but not the technology technology is super advanced already by far what, what's your take on that absolutely um that's uh, that's a very very fair fair point and um you need to ensure that you um that uh, you also look at from the other side and thanks ricardo for, for adding that i couldn't agree more that basically um, today it is when you order something, you expect that it gets either delivered same day. Uh, very often you see that in the United States and in some countries in London, um, as well as now in some parts of Germany, uh, sometimes um, you get it. Not so often, I know that. But basically that's exactly also the technology is impacting that and see coming back to the customer experience um, and, and linking it. You need the technology because it is expected that um, the change in the process in how fast you can provide everything is seamless now, more or less. And um, I remember very well when I was in the States, it was 2017 uh, before I returned uh, in the mid of the year, so in May, uh, Memorial Day. I ordered something in the morning, in the afternoon, it was delivered on Memorial Day, uh, bank holiday in the, in the States. This is really now showing also, wow, so the e-commerce, the front end, coming back to the supply chain, is connected now um, to the warehouse, to the inventory. Basically, it gets connected then to a driver, um, um, putting it first from the warehouse um, um, into a box and then into a car um, to send it over uh, to my to my home at this point in time. And this is also driving customer experience certainly and the technology, the disruptive technology available is a prerequisite of, of doing that. And this is this is um, showing us also how impactful it is and how fast you really can ensure um, that you have everything what you order basically in real time. By the way, also with machine learning and artificial intelligence, that's another great example. How is a warehouse organized? Without machine learning, it's not possible. By not considering what do you need to pick from which location to put it in a box, uh, what gets combined in which box to send it to the right um, person who has ordered it. This is exactly where you need the technology and the technology meets uh, the customer experience. Thank you very much. We don't have any other question, but I, I think the points, you know, the 
Oh, I ha we, ha we have another question. The second, he was writing. That was a long question. It said, "Thank you for one interesting insight into the supply chain and the future post-COVID. We have somewhat unique situation here in the UK, uh, having left the U. The U. That's right. In numerous right. conversations with UK manufacturers, there is a drive to rebuild the local infrastructure and localized supply chain." Consider yeah. considerable opportunities are being taken up. One application that has not been mentioned is the FMEA. Maybe you know what's this, I don't know what's F M E A, which would explore the problems of extended uh, supply chain in relation to customer experience. We should uh, consider all the people that are considered customers, the middle dealers, transport manufacturers, and uh, finally, the end user, okay? The customer is different depending on where you are in the supply chain. That's right. I spend much time, <laughs> excuse me, much time drawing the supply chain, which has different sectors for the customer journey in each part of the supply chain. We're saying that is is Nigel Packer is also a, a member of the of the ECX, e, e, ECXO. He's just making observation here, and uh, yeah, supply chain changes. As I think nobody actually, besides talking with you all the times that I focus in, 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 in when I started my career in ERP and supply chain working to intra. I never really focus on that, but now that you have the pandemic, this becomes the main thing. Because it's so important, we never realize it, we never actually value it so much uh, a supply chain how we went to this. Everybody needs a mask and all the things that happened, so we was all disesperated in certain ways. Well, we are we are coming to, to to the end, but before we go, I would like Dr. Vomer, do you wanna say a last uh, some some last things and how the people can contact you and uh, how by the way, uh, Dr. Vomer is in the network right now, so he's going to be forever there until we die in 100 years. So I'm sure you can contact <laughs> him. <laughs> Many thanks, Ricardo. First of all, um, I really enjoyed. Um, I also like uh, the questions. Not sure about the last one about Brexit. We did not cover that entirely but um, many thanks really for the active contribution and i hope we could have uh, with this conversation really great session i uh, highly appreciate that um, i know we didn't cover really sustainability to a large extent but ricardo you are now setting up this um, fantastic what you're doing um, and very happy to join again to talk a little bit more about sustainability as a full focus very happy to do that and if you want to connect with me feel free marcel former um my name um, is um, on LinkedIn as well as mformer1 is my Twitter handle. Um, very happy to connect with you and um, yeah, look forward to um, staying in touch. Ricardo, many thanks for the uh, invite. Thank you very, very evening. much for your time and have a Thank great you. evening in Frankfurt. Thank you. Same for you. Have a good bye one. Bye-bye. Bye. Cheers. Thank you very yeah. much.